Get him. Go on. Get him. Lunch time. <laughs> this is the telephone of Hugo Mount Batten. Unfortunately, I'm frightfully awfully too busy to answer this infernal human contraption, so please leave your message after the tone. Hi Hugo, this is TGV. Um, just a quick message to let you know that I'm not going to be doing the Daniel Wellington review. Everything I've I've wanted to say about that brand, I've already done it, so I'd prefer if um, you would do it. Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show. Today I'm going to finally do a video addressing skeleton watches which uh, you guys have been requesting for quite a long time. Uh, so I decided to put my money where my mouth is and I had a lot of fun doing this. The challenge was to find the best three options under, well, almost under $300. Now before I get into this, I'll do a quick wristwatch check. I'm wearing my Hamilton. This is the Thinomatic, in my opinion, one of the greatest watches Hamilton ever made. It has the little micro rotor inside the movement, if you recall the video, undeniably pure class. Anyway, uh, let's crack on. So the history of skeletonization in watches is nothing new at all. It goes all the way back to the very beginning of mechanical clock making. In fact, the earliest mechanical clocks used in clock towers were always skeletonized because it obviously it allowed people to get access to the the wheels and the gears and, and to be able to fix it. But in the 19th century, when things got a little bit more sophisticated and miniaturized, there was a massive trend in uh, clockmakers, especially mantle clocks specifically, to show off the, the inside workings of the timepiece. In fact, only the other day I was looking at a beautiful fusee and chain, what's called an empire clock, I think this was from about 1840, absolutely stunning thing. And guys, we've got to remember that these clocks, this was cutting edge technology. I mean, it's totally dated now, of course, we live in this digital online world, but back then it was a, a real demonstration of one's wealth. It's so amazing how times have changed. Now, the pioneers of this were primarily the English and the French, and as the history of horology uh, demonstrates the advancement in the miniaturization of these mechanics and the advent of pocket watches this style then moved into pocket watches and then you see you know the likes of Vachon Constantin, Adama Piguet, um, all, all, the, all the big greats, Patek of course, making some absolutely exquisite timepieces with pocket watches becoming obsolete and the transition to wristwatches. The same thinking and philosophy was applied here. It's usually attributed to Hort Horology brands to show off the prowess of their watchmaking and also obviously the quality and craftsmanship of that decoration. Now I'm not quite sure which brand was the first to do it in a wristwatch. If I had to put bet my money I'd I put it on Breguet. I wouldn't be surprised if Breguet were the first. But if anyone knows, please do share in the comments below. I'd love to hear and find that out. If you're interested in the uh, skeletonization of clocks, particularly in the 19th century, I highly recommend a book by Royer Collard. It's almost the whole subject in itself. So the first watch that I purchased, I scored this for an absolute bargain, brand new on eBay for just under 200 bucks, is this Seagull. Now Seagull, if you're not familiar, I have uh, reviewed the 1963 column wheel chronograph. Uh, the story behind that was fascinating. It just demonstrates what Seagull do best. So Seagull have been going since 1955. They're actually China's largest mechanical watch maker. 
they make what, um, movements for a whole host of brands. If you recall the Timex Marlin, the new one, they mass produce mechanical movements on a massive scale. So you'll find them in, in a whole lot of great brands as well. And interestingly, they are state owned and they do everything from very basic manual wines all the way to extremely impressive tourbillons. Now I mentioned the 1963 because that was a really good example of the, what they're able to do. They actually bought the equipment from Switzerland that put together the old Venus 175 movements. But in here we have the caliber ST1601K. It's a 21 joule movement operating at 21,600 vibrations an hour. This is an automatic. It's a lovely 38 millimeters uh, with an exhibition case back, of course, so you, you can really see the exposed bridges. Um, you can even see the barrel spring and as you wind it, it has many wind as well you can see that barrel spring contract um, so it's almost like a, a very very rudimentary um, power reserve in a way they have faux blued hands faux blued markers you can get a rose gold version there is a tiny bit of decoration a skeletonized rotor now if i just pop it on the wrist very quickly for the smaller wrist i have a six and a quarter inch wrist it wears marvelously well almost trench style lugs uh, that give it a bit of an art deco feel yeah it's it's mimicking watches of the 1920s i would say and an onion style crown Power reserve, I'm not quite sure on this movement. It's running <laughs> impressively well, I think about plus 10, which is, uh, considering its price, 200 bucks, very, very good. Uh, my only criticism of this watch is the strap is absolutely horrendous, a forgivable sin. If I was to put a, an expensive crocodile strap, this would look the absolute kipper's knickers, it really would. The chapter ring has very nice, precise minutes and seconds track with some actual guilloche pattern to it. I think this is a phenomenal value for money, fun, and you get to see that escapement beating away the balance wheel um, going back and forth. The hands, in my opinion, are a tiny bit undersized, very leaf hands. Sometimes it's difficult to actually read the time on this, but to be honest, when I look at it, I'm, I get distracted when I'm looking at the the um, the movement. My only other slight negative is, and and I think it will become apparent as I look at the later manual wind watch I, I managed to score. Skeleton watches work much better when they're just manual wind because you can see through it better. Uh, you don't have that rotor, obviously. The size is is perfect. Interestingly, when you pull out the crown, it is hackable, and the case is stainless steel with an entire high polish finish. Very nicely done. Right, let's move on to the next one, and it could only be a swatch, right? So if you watched the video I did recently about my top watches around $100, I featured the Random Ghost, which is basically the modern incarnation of one of Swatch's most iconic early watches from 1983. The Jellyfish, then they re-released it in the 90s, which my wife owns. Those are getting very difficult to find, especially with the translucent plastic, they tend to kind of become discolored. And then in 1999, Swatch collaborated with the hugely important and highly acclaimed Italian architect Renzo Piano, which I've got to say I'm a massive, massive fan of his work. If you're not familiar with Renzo Piano, he's most notable for his collaboration with Richard Rogers, another big hero of mine on the Pompidou uh, Centre in Paris, which is in 1977. He also is the architect behind the, the fabulous uh, Shard in London, the Whitney Museum of American Art, in New York City, just around the corner. And I mean, I could go on and on and on. He's won so many prizes for his uh, architecture. So to manage to track one of these down in almost new condition with the box is just phenomenal. Um, don't laugh, but I'm actually, <laughs> I actually keep this in the safe. It's worth a lot more than, I mean, it's gonna skyrocket. And also, as you can see, it's not discolored. I tracked this down for just a smidgen over 200 bucks from Germany. So it's completely plastic. We have a quartz movement inside. It has the 90s size to it. So it's 34 millimeters 
compared to the modern Ghost, which I think is 41. If you're very lucky, you'll find one for under 300. There are several modern uh, versions that Swatch do now. There's an automatic called Body and Soul, that is 38 millimeters, and that is about 150 bucks. Very, very cool indeed. So it's cool that you got that automatic option. And then you've, of course, you've got the random Ghost, which is the SU0K111. They are icons of horology. I mean, Swatch, uh, starting in 1983, they were designed to be inexpensive, fun. And what is so fun about this particular one, it's called the Jelly Piano, obviously, Jellyfish, uh, Renzo Piano. Much like the Pompidou's Center, skeletonization was a logical choice. Apparently, from my research, the shapes and colors were directly inspired by Renzo Piano's work. The blue from rolls of blueprints, tiny cardboard models, uh, traditional tools of the architect trade. So it, it almost looks like kind of abstract work of art. The only downfall obviously is that it's not the most efficient at telling precise time. I adore its playful style, the colors, it has some pizzazz to it, it's very futuristic. The pencil hands, almost like plunger hands, just brings a smile to your face. God, it's even got the original price on the back. I just can't believe I got this. So, um, yeah, I, I know a lot of people will laugh spending 200 bucks on, on a little plastic quartz watch, but trust me, there are some big collectors out there. And it's, it's wonderful to own a little bit of history. Yeah, that was designed by a man, a living legend of architecture and design. Really, really cool. Okay, the last watch, and this has got to be the coolest of the bunch, is from Wittenauer. Originally an American company, founded in New York. They were founded in 1885. And it's long overdue that I feature them on the channel. They were then bought by Bulova, so they're part of the Bulova uh, group now, who then they bought were bought by Citizen, so it's part of that family. They have an astonishing history behind them. Initially, they were famous for actually their clocks and instruments for, I think, the US Navy, and most famously of all, the instruments, uh, timing instruments used in the aircraft uh, flown by Amelia Earhart on the first solo flight across the Atlantic. They also have a long history of involvement with long jeans. And in fact, along with the Rolex Daytona and the Speedmaster and a few other watches, they were entered into the trials for the NASA Space Watch. This is obviously way back in the 60s. So they have a very prestigious and illustrious history of making uh, timing instruments for aviation. And this little darling I picked up on eBay. I went slightly over my budget. I think it was just a little bit over $300. This is a 60s piece, manual wind, 10 karat gold filled case. Inside is the caliber 10ML1. Now I'm not sure uh, what speed it operates at, but it has 17 joules. Believe it or not, this originally used to be a man's watch. Uh, it was intended as a man's watch. It's very, very small. It's about 33 millimeters and a remarkable eight millimeters thin. Now it did come on a mesh bracelet, which was also original. Uh, however, the, a lot of the, uh, this was just plated with gold, has kind of started to tarnish and wear off. I think it's much more fitting to have it on a strap. It has black hands and what is astonishing, the pelage work, there's actual real decoration going on here. The view from the back is amazingly elegant and, and just dazzling to behold. It's not the best performing piece. It's quite erratic. There's no seconds hand so judging its accuracy is, you know, it's off by, <laughs> it's off by a few minutes every couple of days. The flattest lugs I've ever seen with the chapter ring that is quite reminiscent of like, it's almost like a pie pan dial, but of course the, pie, the, the main dial is not there. It's an inverted pie pan dial, that's what it is. Incredible, so you can see why I got it. The size doesn't bother me at all. I mean, guys, we've got to remember Clark Gable, one of the most stylish actors of all time. He used to wear a 28 millimeter Rolex. Obviously gonna be too, small for a lot of people but for me it's absolute perfection so i'm just going to put it on excuse me hold one second and there you go as a dress watch i mean look at that sorry I take my pen just look at that it's so slender it's unbelievably slender 
and it looks a million dollars. And that's what a good skeleton watch should do. It doesn't have to be expensive. It comes from a brand with amazing history. My only criticism is I wish the hands were blued. I'd be willing to pay double just to have blued hands. Very minimalist style case, which doesn't detract from the, the splendor of that dial. We looked at the Rolex Daytona, which is quite flashy recently. Well, this is, it's kind of classy bling, if you will. Yeah, and has a wonderful tick to it. I don't actually know that much about this watch, but guys, you know, 300 bucks, who cares? It's, it's just magic. I mean, really charming piece. So ultimately what this watch demonstrates is that there's tons of vintage options out there. So just have a hunt around. We've got a Swiss made manual wind with such bewitching and ravishing sublime majesty as that. Amazing value for money. Ultimately, it's the quintessential dress watch. It'll slide under any cuff. And also you have that added advantage with a skeleton watch that, you know, if I, if I look at this, the seagull here, it's a great conversation piece. And also I think most importantly, if you're getting into watches, seeing the components, seeing the bridges and the, the balance wheels and the, the wheel train and, you know, when you wind it, having that immediate um, response to turning the crown, it reminds you of the magic of watches. The only slight criticism I have with the, uh, the swatch, at the end of the day, it's a quartz. You don't have that mechanical magic, right? Uh, it's more about design, whereas these are about enjoying the, the engineering. Now, I will give one more suggestion, an honorable mention. I was thinking about buying this. Rotary is a brand we discussed in that, uh, that previous video. Of, what was it, top um, 100, $100 watches, right? They offer a skeletonized watch as well. Uh, however, it's 42 millimeters, and so I kind of chickened out. But I have seen it in the flesh on a friend of mine's wrist, and it is gorgeous. If you want the larger size, I recommend the Greenwich by Rotary. They have a great history, independently owned, made watches for the British military. They're still headquartered in London, but they are actually an ancient uh, Swiss brand founded in 18, I think it was 1885, if I remember, recall correct, if I recall correctly. I'm gonna leave it there. Please do share your suggestions for the best skeleton watches. Let me know your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions, all the rest of it down below. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao. This is a public service reminder for the good gentry. Please follow us on Instagram, join the Facebook UGWC group, and click on the bell to keep notified of new videos. Don't forget to keep it positive, keep it gentry, onwards and upwards. Thank you.